started recording yet. Gareth? Okay. Yeah, it started, yep. Yeah. Okay, good evening, everybody, um, and welcome to the Environment and Generation Scrutiny Committee on Tuesday, the 18th of January. Um, so prior to uh, the commencement of the business, I'm just going to give a few housekeeping rules for everybody. Um, I think we're mostly familiar with them by now, but I will run through them. Is please to remind all participants that this meeting will be recorded and copy archived for future viewing. And for everybody, if you could mute yourselves when you're not speaking, and that avoids any sort of background noise or feedback as well when others are speaking. If you wish to speak, can you please put your hand up? Um, so they can either be seen on screen or raise the hand or chat function. I know there's a couple of people in on the phone tonight, but hopefully it should still flag up um, your hand. If not, ju just just uh, shout in at that point. We'll make sure we get you in. Just make sure we don't miss anybody. If anybody's in difficulty hearing or being heard when they're addressing the committee, can you either let myself know or the or Gareth as democratic officer? Um, and if you have a webcam, then try turning that off because sometimes that does help with broadband or Wi-Fi band fits. So at least you can hear and then be heard. And it does seem to be there does seem to be a few issues and glitches in the system at the moment. So, so that may be well worth doing if you're having any problems. Um, so as I said, I'd just like to welcome everybody, all our committee members and cabinet members and officers. Um, and I'm going to go on to the first item of the, on the agenda. Um, which is um, apologies for absence. So do we have any? Uh, no apologies provided in advance of the meeting, Chair. Right, OK. And item number two then, which are the minutes of the meeting held on the 14th of December 2021. Are we all happy to agree those minutes? Yeah, lovely. Yeah. OK. Item number three then, which is to receive declarations of interest, including whipping declarations, under the Council's Code of Conduct. So do we have any? No? Okay. All right, so the next item on the agenda um, is the rural roads policy. Now, this is going to be a presentation by Mike Clogg. Um, and this is actually come, this is on the back of the request from the Community Liaison Committee um, and for it to be looked at by the Scrutiny Committee. So that's why it's here with us tonight. So. Uh, Mike, I'm going to hand over to you if you'd like to take us through the presentation. OK, thank you, Chair. I'll just uh, look to share the presentation, if I can, on my screen, hopefully. Uh, I'm hopeful that you can all see that. Yeah. Uh, I can't, why can't I start it? No. Oops. From beginning. There we go. OK, so hopefully you can all all see that. Um, so there, this is a, a presentation regarding the rural roads policy. Um, and generally, the the, uh, the presentation will explain the, the general process used uh, to maintain the highway uh, and that the different characteristics of rural and urban roads are already um, embedded within the council's processes. So if I move on to the first slide and just run through uh, the current requirements or duties that we uh, we work to in terms of maintaining um, the highway network. So uh, first of all, uh, we've got uh, or we manage the local road network in accordance with uh, statutory duties um, and um, the statutory duties are listed in the uh, in the items going down there. So in terms of uh, maintenance, uh, we have a, a duty under Section 41 of the Highways Act uh, to ensure safe passage as far as reasonably uh, practicable. Uh, and then um, we've also got a duty to ensure traffic moves freely uh, and reduce congestion uh, whenever practicable. And that's under the Traffic Management Act 2004. And finally, uh, we've got a, a duty to take steps to prevent accidents occurring. Um, and that comes under Section 39 of the Road Traffic Act. So these, uh, these apply to all roads within 
the council's local highway network, whether uh, they're urban or rural. So moving on to the next slide. It's not working. Don't know why it's not working. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Thankfully it is. Um, OK, so just looking at uh, maintenance um, of the highway. Uh, and the first thing to uh, to mention is that we have uh, we already have a highway safety inspection manual which sets out uh, a specific criteria in how we maintain the highway. Uh, that manual generally specifies um, inspection intervals and uh, intervention levels that we use when uh, assessing um, uh, the condition and safety of the highway. So the council's uh, inspection intervals uh, are then based on a, a network hierarchy, and that hierarchy takes into account the class of the road, or as we refer sometimes as to whether it's a strategic route, uh, a main distributor route, a link road, or or perhaps just a, an access road to a particular town or, or village. Um, so the network hierarchy then generally recognises the the nature and character of individual roads uh, and 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 it makes sure and it ensures that uh, those roads are maintained effectively. The hierarchy, as I've probably mentioned, um, differentiates based on volume traffic, uh, traffic and usage. Um, and as you can understand, for different classes of road, obviously an A-class road or a, a strategic road, will have a lot more traffic uh, and probably heavier heavier traffic using that uh, that road than you would perhaps a, a, an unclassified road. Um, so the the demands on on that road then would be uh, more uh, excessive uh, and probably require uh, inspection and possibly intervention uh, um, on more regular basis. So on that. Uh, in order to recognise that, we uh, we have different inspection uh, intervals, which are monthly, three monthly, and six monthly. Obviously, the higher class, the uh, uh, the busier roads are inspected uh, monthly uh, because they're more critical, and the roads that perhaps take less traffic, less usage, are then only inspected, say, uh, six monthly uh, intervals. So the intervention levels that we use, uh, they're currently set at uh, 40 millimetre. And when we say 40 millimetre, we refer really to the depth of the defect, um, albeit the inspectors when they're assessing um, uh, risk will look at the size, um, the sort of plan area of a defect as well, but generally it's the depth. And for all roads, uh, it's 40 uh, millimetres at this present time. Uh, we do uh, have a separate interval uh, uh, intervention level of 20 mil, where we have a footway running alongside the road. Um, uh, so there's there's the two two levels, 40 and 20 mil uh, for carriageway and footway. On to the next slide. I don't know why, but it's messing around a little bit. Right, okay. So investment in highway infrastructure. So in order to maintain uh, the um, the council's uh, highway uh, as best we can. Uh, we uh, we have a highway maintenance three-year plan. Um, you've probably heard of the three-year plan many times in the past. It's uh, it's um, it, it's an effective way uh, whereby we uh, determine uh, priorities for resurfacing, um, and we uh, we are due to present a a new three-year plan to cabinet. Uh, towards the end of this financial year, hopefully it's being prepared at the moment. Uh, so the three-year plan, uh, it has a prioritisation scoring system uh, and that considers eight separate factors. And just to run briefly through uh, those, those eight separate factors, um, one is the road class and uh, we've mentioned that in the previous slide, obviously road class is important because that differentiates um, the type of usage and the uh, traffic that might be used in a particular road. Obviously, the more traffic, the more you would expect the the, the carriageway or the, the surface to deteriorate a little bit quicker. Um, 
We also uh, undertake visual inspection uh, or, or engineers inspections. We review claims that we've had uh, for any particular road um, to determine, um, you know, its potential uh, condition. Obviously, the, the, the poorer the condition, the more likely we'll get claims in. Uh, complaints as well, uh, similar process. Uh, we also look at the maintenance costs. Um, obviously, if uh, if a road is deteriorating quickly, um, then the maintenance costs will will start to rise quite steeply, and that's an indicator then that um, a, a different intervention might be required in terms of uh, resurfacing or or other. We also consider um, uh, bus routes as well. Um, obviously, because bus routes would indicate uh, that perhaps the road is, is slightly busier in nature. And again, there would be more wear and tear on the surface, making it deteriorate quicker. Um, so those are some of the factors we consider. Um, uh, we, we do uh, we do weight those factors uh, and the main uh, the main criteria generally uh, and the more heavily weighted are the visual assessment, engineers assessment, and the maintenance maintenance costs. Um, uh, so uh, we feel that those are probably the more important um, of the uh, of the factors which allow us to assess and prioritise condition. So the annual works program is is uh, is obviously limited by budget available, um, and. The the, uh, the factors and the uh, and the process I've just explained uh, is a is a really good way of 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 helping us to prioritise what roads uh, need to uh, to be resurfaced and uh, you know allows us then to uh, allocate the money in the most appropriate and an advantageous fashion for the council. So safety on the local highway network. Um, we have a responsibility for safety in terms of uh, collisions uh, and the way we deal with that is we review collisions um, on the local highway network uh, from information provided by the police or it actually comes through uh, Welsh Government but the police themselves have a duty to investigate injury collisions. Uh, those injury collisions are, coll uh, are collated is submitted to the Welsh Government for validation and then on a six monthly basis uh, that information is passed to all the local authorities uh, in Wales uh, in relation to their highway network and from that information then uh, we uh, we review where collisions have taken place and we try and determine if any particular uh, works or improvements are required to try and reduce the risk of future collisions. Obviously the more collisions we have, then it becomes more of a priority for us uh, in terms of looking at an intervention and working with the police on, on those interventions. So uh, we use the above, uh, above um, uh, collision data, as I've mentioned, to review and prioritise funding for future safety improvement schemes. Um, also, we review highway safety concerns on a on a case by case basis. So it doesn't you know, it doesn't necessarily follow that we only uh, look at uh, injury collisions. We will look at uh, uh, um, other other concerns, safety concerns highlighted to us or brought to our attention by uh, members, the public, uh, um, and we will try and determine if there's any works that are required to reduce risks. But um, we have to revert back to uh, the previous information I've said, and, and you know, because we we are uh, we have limited monies available, we do have to consider where that is best spent, and the best way of doing that sometimes is looking at uh, where the injury collisions uh, are occurring and and allocating the money accordingly. So that's uh, information on uh, maintaining the highway uh, or reducing collisions. Uh, in summary, uh, the management of um, individual roads is, is, is based around our statutory duty, which I explained in the first uh, slide. Um, that generally places a, uh, or generally there's, there are procedures, we have procedures in place already to consider the nature and character of each road, um, irrespective of whether they're urban or rural. Um, and generally then the above, the above processes that we've just run through very briefly 
ensure that uh, capital monies is allocated appropriately, whether that's to the urban or, or rural network. So that um, that's generally the end of the presentation. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to um, to take them and try and answer them. OK, thanks, Mike. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions or comments? Uh, Michael? Here I come. Yes, th thank you, Mike, very much for that report. Now, as, as other members of the committee were, might be aware, this is a matter that came out of a community liaison committee meeting last year when any community council raised the issue of a rural road policy, which is a very difficult thing to say unless you say it slowly. Um, and then that was referred to cabinet who essentially decided that there was no need for a separate rural road policy because all roads are the same. So I, I requested that this matter come before the environment and regeneration scrutiny because rural roads, and I'm not going to say that too many times, are different, if you like. I mean, I in my ward, I go to four different community councils, and the one thing that is always being raised is highway safety. Last week in Pendoylan, one of the councillors was very upset and vociferous about the danger on local roads, the danger to children, to pedestrians, to everybody who's trying to use the roads. We're fortunate here in Peterston that currently we have the trial 20 mile an hour limit, which is working to a certain extent, but obviously people who don't obey the law ignore it anyway. But the request was, and it is useful to hear what the policy is, but the request is really what can be done in the future to devise or improve a specific policy for the rural roads so that it's safer for people to walk uh, for example, later in this meeting, we're, we're having an active travel presentation, um, which completely excludes the rural areas, doesn't doesn't concern them at all, doesn't help us to get around. You know, if I want to walk on a Sunday morning from my house to church in Pendolan or from my house to church in St. Bride Superili, I take my life in my hands because of the state of the roads. Um, as I mentioned to, to Mike in a specific email uh, a couple of weeks ago about one of the junctions coming out of Peterston where it links to Pendoylan, um, the give way lines have worn away. And no, there are no sort of injuries there, but there are constant close shaves. I've had a car written off there within the last two years. It wasn't injured, so it's not reported to anybody. But because people are using the, the roads as, as shortcuts and rat runs, some of them don't know where the giveaway lines are. And they don't care. and They just shoot across. So it's really what can we do in the future to improve the way that the country lanes are managed? Because none of them are designed for vehicles anyway. They're all evolved over hundreds of years for for walkers and horses and stuff like that. They're not designed for the heavy vehicles we, we come through. So what can be done to review the rural roads network, to look at the safety signs at junctions, to look at the weight restrictions to stop heavy vehicles coming through, to look at how pedestrians can, can have active travel from one village to another without putting their lives at risk so that children on bicycles can go on, on the road. I never let my children go on, on the road when they were little because it's just not safe. Uh, so it's all those issues that need to be addressed as a much bigger question. And there is a perception out here amongst the people who come to our community councils that we're largely left out of these things. And the focus is on the people who live in the town to have the roads maintained to a high specification. Whilst out here, yes, I, I, I understand what you say about maintenance of the roads, but we still have um, every, like everybody has potholes, bits of the edge of the roads running away, the, the banks being eroded by heavy vehicles going through, you know, during the, the summer months, overgrown hedges, which, which nobody is told to cut back, which again, reduce safety. Um, again, if the roads are inspected, you can see some areas where there, there might be a slow or a stop sign. Certainly right outside my house, we have a slow sign and the S has completely disappeared into the, into the, the verge, it's, it's gone. So things like that need to be addressed. But it's a much bigger question than just looking at the current um, road policy. It's what can we do to improve it in the future, to make life safer for everybody. I'm not coming up with the answers now, and I'm, I'm, I might even broach the, the, the terrifying prospect of perhaps 
having a consultation on this just to see what local people do think and, and whether people have ideas. Um, you know, the, our 20 mile an hour limit here in Peterston, for example, it's not enforced, but the volunteers were out the weekend with their high vis jackets on, checking the speed, uh, which is good. But then somebody said, well, why should we expect our residents to do that? But it's a question of cooperation. So my, my question is, what could we do as a council to improve this policy in the future? Because certainly the, the communities that I represent want to see improvements, the way that everybody is kept safe and the way that they can travel safely, not necessarily in a car, you know, on foot, on a bike, even on the horses, they take these horse riders around here, take their lives in their hands because you don't know when a vehicle is going to come up behind you at 30 miles an hour. And that's, that can be fatal. And it's, it's, and again, the perception, just going back to what you say about um, accidents where somebody is injured, there's a perception that this is, this is what was said at the meeting last night. The council won't do anything until somebody's killed, and that shouldn't be right. We should be looking at potential dangers and solving them inside. So that, that's my um, my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. Mike, did you want to, Mike Progner, did you want to come back uh, with anything around that? Yeah, I will say a, a few things. Um, obviously, um, uh, not covered there, um, but um, I think one of the first things that mentioned that cabinet perhaps think all roads are the same, and I, I don't think that's the case. I think we fully accept that all roads um, are different. Um, you know, you'll have different rural lanes, um, as same as you have different urban roads. They, they are all different. They've got some slight different characteristics, different quirks, and. You know, we do try uh, uh, and assess each on a case by case basis um, in terms of uh, what the issues are. You know, our inspectors go out on a regular basis inspecting these highways. They will uh, understand each particular road because they become familiar with them. They'll know what the particular problems are. They'll try and deal with them in an appropriate and reasonable manner, uh, given the circumstances. Um, and I think. Um, you know, I, I don't want to take away from uh, some of the comments that were made, but you know, some of the comments are, are, are issues that we have on many of our our roads. Uh, you know, uh, across the Vale, whether that's rural or urban. You know, we've got speed issues in in rural uh, areas. We've got speed issues in urban areas. We've got speed watch campa campaigns in rural areas. We've got speed watch campaigns in urban areas. Um, we've got all these things uh, throughout our network at, at various locations, you know, generally around uh, residential um, or uh, um, residential areas where, where people are living. That's where the, the, the most issues and concerns are. Um, and again, we, we work with the police, um, you know, to, to address concerns as best we can. But, um, you know, the in terms of uh, collisions, um, yeah, I have said we, we, we do look at collisions. It, it, it is it's the way we discharge our statutory function. Um, but I've also reassured that we, we will consider things, you know, uh, concerns raised separately um, and, and try and uh, try and deal with those um, those issues as best we can, given the limited funding that we have. The problem being is that trying to attract funding or allocate funding um, you know, where we don't have a, a, you know, a critical um, safety issue is very, very difficult, i.e. Uh, the Welsh, Welsh Government Road Safety Grant, you know, that is based around uh, collision statistics and we have to submit those those bids, um, uh, you know, and, and try, try and justify it given uh, collision statistics. So um, I, I suppose in summary, um, you know, we fully understand you know, people's concerns, both in rural and uh, urban areas, we do try uh, and 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 deal with each individual circumstance as best we can. And, you know, if there's any particular areas uh, that, um, uh, that that members have concerns over, I'm, I'm happy to discuss that individually if uh, if needed. OK, thanks, Mike. Um, perhaps that might be useful, uh, Michael, then if, if you wanted to carry on that sort of conversation with, with Mike Bob another time, might be helpful. All right. Uh, okay, the next speaker then is uh, Councillor Gwyn. John, Gwyn, are you there? Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. 
And the point I want to raise, the biggest problem I'm getting at the moment is mud on the roads. Farmers' vehicles bringing mud onto the roads. Now, this is a big issue in the rural areas. And only last week, um, we had an issue where Nathan Thomas, who I must compliment Nathan Thomas, a very good officer, he, um, he has put a charge on uh, a farmer who uh, basically uh, took more of the lane apart with the mud on his uh, tractor. He, he took all the curbs away. He really made a mess down there after complaints from residents. So I will compliment, but this has to be followed, obviously. But tonight, the Cowbridge Road has got mud, thick mud. Obviously, a farmer's vehicle come out of a field and left half the field on the road tonight because basically from the S Bend on the Cowbridge Road down towards Lantwit Major, at um, you can say virtually it spreads that length down to the garden centre at Meadow Vale. So if you could follow that up tomorrow morning, uh, please, because uh, this is an issue that we're facing all the time. And I do agree with Mike. Um, it is it is difficult. I appreciate how difficult it is, having been a cabinet member of highways. But at the same time, some of these rural roads are in a very poor state. Um, particularly, they get flooded very quickly. Uh, the road between Lantwood Major and Wick, and then the other side of Wick, down to St Brides. There's always a lot of water on the roads, which I avoid travelling that way if I can, particularly in the night, because you can hit water. And uh, quite honestly, you've got no chance if you uh, aquaplane. So that is a big problem. But I appreciate officers can't control the rainfall that comes down over the afternoon. But the biggest problem is the ditching, I think, really, to clear the water. So... I would appreciate some attention paid to farmers that continually um, deface the roads, basically, with mud. I, they say they come on the road, some of them, as if they couldn't care less. And I do think they've got the responsibility. I don't think they realise they've got that responsibility, some of them. And I think we should remind everybody that they are responsible for uh, delivering their mud on the road. And some of these, of course, some of these farmers don't cover their vehicles when they're carrying um, when they're carrying manure between farms and what have you. And subsequently, I was coming down uh, the road from St. Athens to Lantwick Major one day, and I got my car got covered with manure being blown off a vehicle in front of me. So another thing that these vehicles with their trailers need to be uh, covered. So I just wanted to raise those couple of points. I know this is uh, covered, uh, really, we're talking about is maintenance of the roads tonight, but this does come under your policy, S39, uh, which is highway safety. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Gwyn. Did you want to uh, just come back to Gwyn, Mike? Yeah, sure. I fully accept um, what Councillor John is saying. You know, um, it is part of our duties as well. Mud on the highway can be a safety issue. You know, we also have issues with um, uh, with farmers, landowners cutting hedgerows along rural lanes and uh, yeah, the debris that that, that, that that leaves on on rural lanes. I suppose the one thing you know, we must remember is that yeah, these are rural areas. They are farming communities, and we would expect that sort of um, uh, those sort of uh, vehicles to be moving around um, and you know, um, but I fully accept uh, you know we have a duty to try and uh, you know to try and maintain the highway in a safe condition and we work very hard to do that it is an extremely difficult and challenging task to try and keep on top of all these uh, these issues uh, with with farmers pulling out of mud on the highway uh, we're doing our best with the resources we have I'll certainly speak to to Nathan about uh, Cowbridge Road and we'll we'll follow that one through um, you know, in terms of uh, flooding um, on on rural roads, again, uh, we have a program where we uh, we, we maintain ditches and, and maintain um, uh, the drainage systems as best we can. But unfortunately, you know, by their very nature, rural roads, the infrastructure available on on the rural roads is 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 very limited. You know, they're normally 
um, enclosed by uh, hedge banks and there's very little room somewhere sometimes for the water to discharge onto surrounding fields and in on, on many occasions you've got the surrounding fields that are a lot higher than than the roads which again causes problems so um, yeah th these are the challenges of of, of rural areas and, and we try and deal with them uh, on a case-by-case -case basis and uh, you, you know I, I fully accept councillor john's um uh, concerns and comments, we we, you know, we 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 do our best to try and keep on top of those as best we can. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm going to bring in uh, Councillor Andy Robertson next. Andy, over to you. Yeah, Th thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we're missing the point here a little bit. I was at that uh, community liaison uh, meeting, and uh, the point that came up, I think, was that. Uh, uh, some of the people from the community, and it was a double-edged sword, actually. It was a bit difficult to understand exactly what uh, they wanted. But some of them were saying, I think, that they actually wanted a separate rural roads policy. So that basically the sort of roads that uh, we've been discussing uh, would actually come under a different policy where I, I don't know how they thought that was going to work, but I think this is what they were asking for. Now, this was in conjunction with some people saying, that uh, rural roads were being treated as uh, second-class citizens, as it were, in in terms of uh, how, how they were being maintained. So there was this like a, a slight uh, uh, contradiction in what was being asked for. But I think actually what 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 the community councillors were asking for was actually a specific rural roads uh, policy. So I, I just thought I'd just uh, say that because we haven't actually been talking about that very much. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Andy. I think you did refer to that, didn't you, Mike, in your presentation? Would you, do you want to clarify that for us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that is my understanding that uh, a separate policy is uh, has been suggested for um, for rural roads. But um, as part of my presentation, I w what I was trying to to get over and trying to explain was that um, y you know we we, we the process that we have for maintenance uh, of the highway, for making safe the highway, uh, accommodate um, those different characteristics on different types of roads, uh, on the different networks we have throughout the Vale already, uh, and and because they do that, and because we do deal with things uh, on a case by case basis, taking each circumstance on its own merits. Um, I, I was just trying to uh, explain that I didn't think we needed to. Uh, have that such a separate uh, separate policy. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, right, I've got no other speakers from the National Committee, but I have got uh, Councillor Peter King there, his cabinet member, uh, waiting patiently there. Peter, did you want to uh, just make some sort of comments as well? If, if I may, please, Chair. Yes, and ignore my phone. It's just this very second side ring. Um, can I just pick up on a couple of things that have been said? Because I want I want everyone to understand that I am I'm incredibly sympathetic to the issues. Um, and I'll start with 20 miles an hour because it's an interesting one. Um, the uh, pilot in St. Brides is supported by the Welsh government, but even that is not enforced by the police. The other two are ours and therefore we're going to get even less support from the police. But on the other hand, I, I get feedback um, where the speed watch patrols, um, after about three warning letters, you get you get a knock, knock on the, you might get a knock on the door from a police officer. And um, I, I, I'll not name anybody or the location, but one such certain person has had one of those and has subsequently been seen driving at never more than 17 mph through that particular village. So it does have an effect. Um, and and that, that and if, if it's about changing the hearts and minds rather than fining somebody afterwards, I think that's that's got to be worth perse persevering with. And perhaps in about 18 months time, um, the, the people who live and pass through these areas are going to be better aware of 20 miles an hour than, than I am. Um, because when, when it becomes the speed limit across Wales, if the Welsh suddenly have the way. And that leads me into my major point. I think it's all to do with the courtesy and the mindfulness of drivers. And that is not a malaise limited to the rural vale. 
And that really was my certainly my thinking is that um, most of the things people have spoken about tonight um, exist in the towns and in the villages and almost everywhere. Uh, mud and other mess on roads, perhaps not as prolific and as, as so frequently often, but around building sites. It's amazing what they do, where there are grass verges, the way that vehicles chew up the grass verges and, spend, and make an almighty mess on the road, um, block drains. All right, that's that's a shared responsibility for, for us and Welsh water, um, but water on roads. And my view is that, generally speaking, drivers drive around far too fast. Now, you know that I ride a motorbike. On a motorbike, if you hit a pothole or mud or or, or what or water, you're far more likely to come off. And as a consequence, I think I be, I drive slightly more 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 mindfully. And also, I, I the other thing about a motorbike, my old one, makes an awful lot of noise. And Annie will confirm that BSAs were never particularly quiet, um, and it will frighten horses. So I'm always mindful if in a rural area to stop and pull over and let the horse go past me. Um, I have once been mobbed by some cows. That wasn't so good. Um, but coming back to the policy, and this is where I think my officers um, are the stance they're taking, and the one I would agree, and that is the issues for the rural roads might lead to a refined rural road policy. But at the same time, the people who live on trunk roads will say, well, we want a trunk road policy. And the people who live on estates will say, well, we want an estate road policy. And the people who live in towns will say they want a town roads policy. And there's no doubt some other road I haven't thought of. And what I think is that the policy we have does its best with the limited resources we have to fulfil all of those functions, taking into account where the road is and the nature of those things. And then the final comment is I, I plead with all councillors, um, help us, please, because we do not have the staff to send somebody cruising around day in, day out, checking on the lights and the potholes and the road surface and all the rest of it. You are our eyes and your ward and your ward residents. And, and Mike will tell you he's not always pleased to get an email from me because it's usually a small shopping list of street lights or potholes or something that people have raised with me. And, and, and you know, again, I'm not, I'm not suggesting we can repair them immediately, but we can at least take, try to take measures. So far as the mud on the road is concerned by the farmers, Farmers annoy me intensely, the damage they do to the to the to the roads. But on the other hand, they often are the people who sort out the hedges and, and, and fix the problems as well. So I I, 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 I I think like a lot of things, there isn't an easy answer. But I genuinely believe that our, 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 our roads policy is the is the best we can offer to be fair to everybody, whatever roads they live on. But obviously, it's your decision. OK, thanks, Peter. Um, I think that was really helpful. Um, oh, Councillor Morgan, did you want to come back in? Sure, I can. The, only to say this, I'm concerned that, that this discussion might be the end of the matter. I, I know we're told that the one, one policy fits all, but I'm, I'm still of the mind, and the, many of the people in the communities I represent are of the mind, that there is a call for a separate road policy. This is what started with the Iwene Community Council, it's what came to Cabinet, and it's what people still believe. Where I'm, and again, I respect what Councillor King and what Mike Clogg have said tonight, but I'm speaking from the people who live in these Lynch communities, Driscoll. and they feel that, that is there is exiting. a need for a different policy. Um, and I'm asking whether this committee would be prepared to, to go back to Cabinet and, and ask them to look again at the whole concept of having a different policy because this is something that's not going to go away it's going to get worse and they do feel that they are the, the sort of neglected residents in the Vale of Glamorgan at the moment because they don't seem to benefit from any of the, the grand schemes like active travel that are proposed all they're asking for is for people to look at making things safer to look at traffic control issues safety issues to so that people can walk along the road without fear of being knocked over. So um, I don't know, forgive me if I'm, I'm not au fait with the formalities of this, but if there's a, a means of, of taking a recommendation back from this committee to cabinet saying we want to look again at rural roads, that I, that's what I would ask this committee to support me on. Yeah, OK, all right. Thank you, Michael. Um, I mean, obviously, most of the, the, the issues 
the you know, I agree with Peter, they are the same for rural as in urban and, and everything else in between. Um, but I'm I mean, I'm happy to put a recommendation forward from the committee just to ask uh, Cabinet to to review the decision. Um, I'm happy to put that forward if, if everybody, if Michael, you want, or Michael, did you want to propose that and I'll second it? Um, and I'll yes, just okay. review may, the may decision I, and to relook at it. May I propose that, Chairman, please? Okay, then you, and I'll second that then, okay. Um, and it's no slight on any of the work that that's being done there, Mike. Please, you know, please pass that to the highways. It's just actually asking look, just to have a look at that review, uh, and, and to see, you know, whether they, there is anything that they can maybe add to the policy. I don't know, uh, without that being looked at. Um, Councillor Bailey, did you want to come in? Jim, in some respects, you kind of just covered that for me, Chair. Which was I was going to offer to second that. I do think that. Uh, it would send a strong statement to rural communities that if we were to look at this again and have a separate roads policy. I appreciate that some of the things overlap and there are common issues, but um, I don't think, I, well, I'll rephrase it. I can see the strengths in having a separate roads policy and it's something that's brought up time and time again um, since I've been a councillor. And I, I think Michael's perfectly right to, to raise this. And I do believe my colleagues in, in our group would support that. It was to come forward with a rural policy. So yeah, I know you've seconded it already, but just to echo my support for what Michael Michael said, I wholeheartedly agree. Okay then. Okay. Um, is everybody in agreement, or is everybody not happy with that? Sorry, Michael, did you want to come in again, or is that just a legacy hand? I think it must be. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Is everybody in agreement? That, or is there anybody who isn't in agreement with that? No? Okay. All right, so that's the uh, the recommendation that's going to go back uh, from this committee. So thank you very much, everybody, for that. Um, item, and thanks, Mike, for the presentation. It was very useful, actually, and very interesting. So thank you very much for that. Um, okay, so item number five, then, which is the, this is a reference from Cabinet, which is the active travel. And this is the results of the consultation for the active travel network map update 2021. And obviously this went to cabinet at the end of last year. So um, I think Kyle Phillips is going to take us through this. So Kyle, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Start. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, two seconds, I'll just get the... So, uh, the purpose of this report uh, is to inform of the results of the public consultation on the Council's proposed active travel maps, which were submitted to Welsh Government for approval. Um, a 12-week public consultation on the proposals took place between the 2nd of August and 24th of October 2021. As part of that consultation, this committee was presented with the proposals on the 21st of September 2021. At that time, the committee's views, which form part of the consultation report, were noted as being highlight safety issues that require the removal of trees, which cause damage to pavements and cycle lanes, encourage greater use of cycle lanes, consider reducing speed limits on rural lanes, uh, there was strong support for the active travel route between Barry and Dennis Powys, and the importance of scheme delivery post consultation was highlighted. Uh, all of these points, unsurprisingly, were raised in the public responses that were received. Uh, following the 12 week public consultation, a number of reports have been produced. The first, Appendix A to the Cabinet report, contains statistics on the online consultation that was held on the Commonplace platform. Uh, the majority of responses came from those aged 35 to 54. There was a fairly equal split between male and female responses. Um, and in total, with the three phases of consultation, uh, the first being through the Commonplace portal again and other engagement events, we ran that for seven weeks and had over 3,200 individual visits to the site. We had a second consultation then for four weeks um, and had over 1,600 visits to the site. And then finally, we held the 12-week consultation, 
um, and details of that fully in this report. Um, if I scroll down, you'll be able to see a bit more information. So we had 2,229 individual visits to the site, 133 individual comments, and 161 agreements to those existing comments. The three phases of the consultation were promoted through a variety of ways, including email and social media campaigns, posters and leaflet drops, as well as engagement with schools and those with protected characteristics. Appendix B to the report contains individual comments that were received through the Commonplace portal by designated locality with responses to each. Uh, within the report, we have highlighted the, um, the themes that were brought out by each locality. Um, so Barry being future routes should be segregated from traffic, priority should be given to pedestrians and cyclists at junctions, uh, areas that do not comply with the Equalities Act should be removed, there was support for active travel routes between Dennis Powers and Barry, Barry and Sully, and Waycock Cross to the airport. Uh, Cowbridge themes support a proposed route between Cowbridge and Estradowin, um, and also a request for a walking route from Cowbridge to Fenthline. Dennis Powers, again, support for the route between Barry and Dennis Powers. Route should be segregated from traffic, and traffic speed should be lowered. Uh, Landswick Major, request for a route from the town to the beach. Route should be segregated from traffic. Traffic speed should be lowered. Uh, in Panath, we had support for a Panath head and link. Queries raised about gradients in Panath. Um, concerns around rail, railway wharf becoming cycling only. Um, and priority should be given to pedestrians and cyclists at junctions. Uh, Roos East Abathor should be uh, included on the map. And support for a Barry to Roos route. St. Athen, the request was for uh, Gileston to be included. And then finally in Sully, we had requests for a route to Swanbridge, support for improved Sully to Cosmeston route, uh, with emphasis on using the old railway line, and a request to prioritise routes along Cog Road. In addition to the, the, the comments that came in on the um, Commonplace portal, we were also sent um, emails into our active travel inbox. Again, we've, we've listed every comment in Appendix B and put officer responses. Um, we had a number of groups who sent um, uh, comments and, and queries into us, including Moving Safely Dennis Paris, Bail Valleways, Our Future Community Sully, Panath Residents Association, and Barry Friends of the Earth. Uh, Appendix C and D to the report confirm how routes are prioritised and have a pri prioritisation list for each designated locality. Nearly half of the 252 active travel routes on our maps are considered priority. However, it would be up to the Council to decide when and which routes move forward for funding. Uh, the final Appendix E shows the, the final routes that are, that are to be submitted to Welsh Government. Following the public consultation, three amendments have been made to the maps uh, since Committee saw them last on the 21st of September 2021. We have the addition of the route down to Lantwick Major Beach. Uh, East Abathor has now been included, um, and Dingle Park in Panath has been added as well. Uh, these maps are basically a comprehensive plan for the future of active travel in the Vale. Only routes on these maps will be eligible for future Welsh Government active travel funding. Welsh Government have been fully briefed throughout the process and gave positive feedback during the consultation. Um, the maps were submitted to Welsh Government just before the, the 31st of December 21 deadline. However, we did caveat our submission uh, with the fact that they needed to go through this committee as well before they were given final sign off. I think that the whistle stop tour of the report there. OK, thanks, Kyle. I mean, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, detail in that report, but very interesting reading. Um, and also the maps are included in that report for everybody to have a look at as well. Yeah. Um, so has anybody got um, any comments or thoughts? OK, Councillor Andy Robertson, you're first. Yeah, thanks, Chair. A, a couple of things, Kyle. Thanks for that. It's uh, very interesting. Um, first thing is uh, quite a number of uh, people I noted actually said they had difficulty in uh, accessing the maps or the maps were a problem for them. Uh, was that something which just happened at the beginning and was resolved or did it carry on throughout the consultation? That's the first one. Yep. The second one is uh, the people in Dennis Paris 
are very, very keen to get this uh, active travel route between uh, Dennis Paris and Barry sorted out. And this has been rumbling on for a very long time. My good friend and uh, uh, my uh, whatever he was, uh, Councillor uh, Chris Williams, actually made a big effort to get this sorted out quite a long time ago. Uh, are we getting any nearer to seeing that actually coming to fruition? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Andy. Kyle, did you want to yeah. respond? Yeah, no problem. I, I think the first thing was we were using um, for the consultation a, a Welsh government portal, which which we were directed to do. Um, there were there were teething problems and there there, had, there were issues with the maps and loading them. It would seem to be that there was so much data on there, it was quite hard to to get it all to to go on top of each other and get all the layers loaded up. Um, that was flagged up with Welsh government from the off, um, and I know they they've been working on it. But we we did have PDFs available. Um, for people to download if they couldn't go into the usual commonplace map. Um, and I think on the second question, being a Dennis Powers resident myself, as you know, um, I'm very keen to get that, that route in place as well. Um, we've got um, consultants looking at previous work that's been done on the scheme to pull everything together. Um, and we are we are looking to take that forward at a rate of knots now. So yeah, that and that was one of the the, the key priorities probably that came out of the consultation that, that we did. Thanks, Kyle. That's uh, very encouraging. Sorry, Chair. Can I ask Kyle to um, stop sharing his screen if he's finished? Okay. Thank you. Here we go. I believe we lost Councillor, but oh, coming back. Hello, Councillor Brooks. Apologies for that. It just it chucked me out again. So, but I'm back in now. Sorry about that, everybody. Yeah, we're on to Councillor Michael Morgan. We'll, we'll, we'll right. to okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Totally throw me now. Um, oh, me. Yeah. Michael, over to you. You're next. Yes, th thank you very much, Kyle. It, it's a uh, nicely presented report, and I know there are many schemes in there that are, are, are popular within the Vale and will be good for our various communities. But my concern with this consultation, as is normally the case with our consultations recently, is the actual response rate, because we, we have a response of what, 142 people out of a population of 130,000 and you mentioned the clicks on the website or something to the order of three thousand pounds. So it's three thousand, well, not pounds, but it's it's a poor response. And I know that's not your fault. And I, I, this is just an observation to to pass back to the cabinet or whatever. Is how can we improve on the way that we inform people about consultations? Because not everybody is is watching the web. Not everybody's going to libraries. Certainly, I haven't had any leaflets through the front door. But we need to find a way to get people to engage. I don't have the answers, no magic wand. People are always quick enough, the keyboard warriors, to criticise our council for things that we have or have not done. But you ask people to come up with responses and ideas, and they're, they're just not there. So I'm just wondering, and just something to pass back to Cabinet, if necessary, is how can we improve the way that we publicise consultations? Okay, thank you that, thanks for that, Michael. And yes, yeah, it is a common concern, I think, with, with lots of things that we do consult on. Uh, Kyle, did you want to just come back? Uh, just, I'll just touch on that briefly. We, we did quite a lot of consultation with the schools, um, and obviously the message going out by a, by a parent mail or whatever means that schools are using have got quite a far-ranging audience. So it, I, I haven't got the... the I can't wave the magic wand to give the answer either, but that did seem to work quite well from, from that aspect. So whether there's other channels that we can use in a similar way to reach a, a far wider audience, um, yeah, we, we can have a look at things definitely in the future. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Ruba, Ruba, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of points, actually, and, and my first point was really... Um, is echoing what what Michael just raised in terms of consultation, um, and you know, and I take your point, Kyle, that you know, because I think I must have received at least two um, 
messages from uh, Stanwell School about um, about the consultation. Um, but I guess it's actually, you know, somehow encouraging people to have, um, you know, an investment in active travel or, 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 you know, in any consultation that we do. But, uh, you know, and that, I think that is a that's a that is a, a longer process. Um, but it, yes, but I suppose in terms of the numbers that you've shown us in terms of the report, you know, I suppose that it 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 it, it, it doesn't feel a lot, although I, I do take your point that it obviously has gone to a lot of people. But and on that point, um, I think in the Panath report, I think I think is it somebody from the, the Panath Tourist Board had raised the point, you know, that actually they would quite, you know, it would have been helpful to have received something in, in the post. So I don't know if that's something we can look at in the future in terms of, you know, bodies like like, you know, organisations like theirs, which would have a, an interest in. A consultation like this if we sent them something by post i know that's kind of very old-fashioned but but maybe that is something that we you know we could look at in the future um the, the second my second point um was really and i'm glad you're there emma was really around the marina because i got through the whole of the report and then i found that the marina hadn't contributed and then i saw the emails at the end um and, and it's really because I know I, I, I'd really like our committee to know that we have been involved quite actively in lots of the issues that the uh, marina residents have raised. Um, and, you know, we've we've had meetings during lockdown about it. We've, you know, gone gone through, um, you know, walk down Terranova Way and, and all the areas that they've, they've covered. Um, and, and I've seen the response um, to the points raised in, in the email, which I think um, captures lo lots of what uh, you in particular, Emma, ha have been uh, responding uh, during this time. But I just wondered, you know, whether, you know, because I'd like to put it on record that, you know, we is something we have explored and whether you, you would just kind of run round, run, not run round, uh, run through the reasoning uh, be behind, you know, the decisions that that uh, the council have made uh, about the marina and around the cycling routes. Um, and then my final point was just a funny point. I liked the point the chap uh, raised about saying it would be really good to get his knees done and then he could be really active. If if, if he could get his his knee operation quite quickly, he could be really active. That was my only other point. Thank you, chair. Okay, thanks, Ruba. Uh, Emma, and yeah, Tyler, I'm not sure if both of you want to respond, or just yeah. you, Emma. Yeah, well, if I if I take the first part of the question, um, and yeah, Ruba's right. Um, we we've been out on a number of occasions around uh around uh, the marina. We've met a number of residents, a number of people that have got interests in in the area, and I mean the main issue there was the success really of the uh, two cycle routes that, that operate and the sheer numbers of people uh, that were using those routes, um, uh, particularly during COVID-19, um, but also during other times um, as part of a leisure, leisure pursuit. Um, both of those routes um, have been flagged under this uh, active travel uh, network. Um, in that some of them need um, some extra work on them. So we have have flagged that. But in terms of the the principles, and um, we've done a number of different things with the residents to try and satisfy them. We've asked cyclists to dismount by signs where um, they shouldn't be travelling because there were a number of locations where they were travelling on, uh, say, John Bachelor Way and other, other locations where they shouldn't have been. So we've, we've done that. Um, we've also... Um, we put a lot of signs down there during um, when, when we had COVID-19 to try and dissuade people from um, or try, trying to get people to respect the residents really more than anything and to have that courteous thought um, for pedestrians as well that might be active in the area. So that I would say that area is probably drawn the most attention for me um, in terms of cycling, um, but a different attention um, attention in terms of the sheer numbers of people that, that have been using it and the popularity of it. But as I say, this plan does note that there are some additional works that need are needed in those locations to get it uh, to a proper active travel standard. Having said that, it obviously it's still there and people can still use it. But if we want to show it on our active travel map uh, properly longer term, we do need to do some further work. So I think, Ruba, we'll be having um, some further discussions on that in due course. 
Okay, thanks, Emma. Kyle, did you have anything to add? I, I think I might have touched on everything there. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't really know what to say about the man with the knee, but you know, <laughs> wish him well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, Gwyn, you're next. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I, I just wanted to mention in the report, there are some comments from residents uh, about a route from Boverton to St. Athen. They're referring basically on the main road, uh, tr uh, the main road that goes from uh, Boverton to St. Athen. I, I fully support uh, their um, claim for travel on this, and I know there's no money available for it because we've discussed this before, Emma, but um, I will say that um, I do support this because people traveling, going to work in the mornings, want to go the quickest way from A to B, and there's a lot of space on that road off the road there's a lot of uh, curbs grass curbs and what have you that could be uh, cut back and a route be made so i would just like to register my support for that and for the future if there is money that does become available whilst i don't support the one as you're well aware on the land Mace road i do support the one from uh, boverton to st Athen, and that route could be brought up actually from boverton up the old road out onto the main road. So there is a possible route there uh, for the future. So I'd just like to register that. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thanks, Gwilla. Did you want to comment, Emma? Or no? Okay. Um, right, I've got no other committee members wishing to speak at this point, um, but I've got Councillor Peter King, with our cabinet member. Uh, Peter. Did you want to say thanks, thanks ever so much for indulging me. Um, I, 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 I couldn't help but smile that sort of the report about the marina um, and wonder if we would also need a marina roads policy. But um, but uh, and I think it does it does hinge around respect and courtesy, which is what we mentioned before. Um, as far as the initial access, um, I think um, it was, was the first thing mentioned. I had exactly the same when it when it first opened up. I, I because my my of, my officers tell me about these things. I generally speaking um, do as they 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 they've suggested, and I and I explored. I had almighty difficulties. About three or four days later, it all worked very much better. Um, with, and so I'm hoping that's what other people found, and they did go back um, within the within the time. Um, as far as the response rates is concerned, that's a very interesting one. But again, I dare to say that as local ward councillors, we have a part to play because I knew that the Cornerswell ward were particularly keen on a number of things, including a particular footpath across a playing field. And therefore, everybody who'd asked me about it, I told them, go on the active travel thing, go and click on it, go and like it, go and comment upon it. Um, and and uh, the, another one that was local to me was the Penarth Headland link. And I said, well, go on the active travel map, go and click on it. Um, and I think that's the that's the that's the way that we can help boost um, the, 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 the response um, by, by helping provide information. You know, it's there. Go and do it and encouraging them. And then the other question, the other thing about funding. And I, and I, 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 and I think Emma will correct me if I get this wrong. The way the Welsh Government will allocate funding will be based upon a number of factors, including how much support there is for any particular project. Um, and therefore, a, clearly a project that has one or two likes or clicks or whatever is going to be further down the pecking order than one that's inundated with support. And that always worries me because sometimes you get lobby groups um, bomb um, some things and and distort the stats. So I'm a little bit nervous about that, which is why I encourage the I encourage my lot to click on a footpath. Um, and then finally, coming back to the Dennis Paris bypass, and I don't mean to drop Emma in it. Honestly, Emma, I love you dearly. Um, she'll tell you that I asked her recently about the project that um, the city region are look interested in which is looking at a possible active travel route from Newport right the way through to Barry, which would in, which could include um, or will include Dennis Powys. But because of the way it's sort of shared out, um, Cardiff Council are um, 
managing the, the, the consultation. And I'd asked her if she could sort of chase up and find out if there was anything that we, we could we could share, because I I, 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 I totally endorse your view. And I, I will also add another comment and she'll, she'll say, oh, here he goes again. Um, the railway, Network Rail, has an awful lot of land in some places. And generally speaking, it's it's a bit level um, and it's away from cars. And really and truly, all we are looking for is about three metres alongside some of their railway lines. And they could be marvellous cycle paths um, that would be that would be far less trouble than cycle, trying to squeeze cars up to one side. Or, and even if, even when there's a nice wide road, who the hell wants to, to cycle or walk when when there's there's traffic thundering by? But but I don't know whether Emma's got any feedback she can share today. If not, um, I promise as soon as we get somebody, we'll find a way of sharing it further. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Emma, do you have any uh, feedback for this? I think very interesting what Peter said. Yeah, I don't have anything on the active travel. Kyle might have, but just to pick up, there is another study happening as well, Peter, um, in terms of the metro enhancement framework. And that's um, looking at all modes of transport right across the Vale of Morgan, uh, uh, Bridge End area, right through that area. So that will be an interesting study as well. And places like Dennis Powys, even uh, you know places in the rural Vale of Morgan that have been mentioned tonight under the roads policy or under active travel, all of those sorts of things need to go into the mix to find out what is right for the Vale of Morgan moving forward in terms of, of larger transport and how we fit into the region. So that piece of work is going to be really interesting. Um, but I, hand, I don't know if Kyle's got any update yeah. on the active travel work. Ah, he has, there yeah. we are. Yeah, so so it was um, Newport, Cardiff, Vale, active travel work, which then got altered to sustainable transport work, which has meant there's now a delay because they're talking to the bus operators, et cetera, et cetera. So the report was due early this year. So. No, we're 18 days in, so I, we should, or Cardiff should be getting something quite soon. So I, I will chase up again next week if we don't have anything through. But um, I was told just before Christmas that, yeah, they'd, they'd had their initial discussions and they, they were pulling it all together. Oh, that's really interesting. Kyle, can I just uh, double check? Sorry, Peter, I'll, I'll bring you back to now. Uh, can I just double check then? What will be the process for the veil? Or who will be around the table with those discussions? Just to double check that, really. Well, it, it's a, it's a, a well tag stage one. So it, it's the yeah. infancy of the project, so to speak. They were, they'll be looking at a number of options, feasibility of a number of options. We held initial discussions with them to, to have a look at what our sustainable transport corridors would be. Um, and obviously they've done the same with Cardiff and the same with Newport. So officers around the table, we've gone through that process. They will then be conducting um, stakeholder engagement, like I said, with people like the bus operators, active travel groups. Um, and then they'll have a long list of options then um, that can then potentially be taken forward to Wildtech Stage 2. Yeah. We, can, we can bring it through um, our, our cabinet scrutiny as well. So when that Wildtech 1 is out, we can bring it through um, for members to have a, a, con a consideration and a say on as well. Um, so that yeah. that would be an issue, will it, Carl? That's what no, we'd normally no. do. Yeah. No, that would be great, Emma. Thanks for that. I think because I think it is important. Is you know these are issues that we fought on, haven't we, all of us, for an awful long time. So so yeah, that that would be that would be great. Thanks, Peter. Did you want to come back? Because I know. I, yeah, I, only, I only, only, only very brief. Only, only very briefly. Thanks, Chair. But I think I mean Emma and Kyle will tell you that there's there's an awful lot more going on than is necessarily being reported and it's one of the conundrums is how how do we get it into the public domain how do we report it because city region does stuff uh, the reports go to cabinet so they they are recorded but people don't but they I, I, i'm not too sure where the scrutiny process is there um the regional transport authority does stuff um and, and i'm not too sure where where the scrutiny is there and so any method in which I can draw attention to these things so that so that the likes of your committee and others are aware of what is coming down the line. All right. I mean, it, 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 it depends. You know, they've got to actually have something to report. But that is one of my concerns is that is that the, the, the general public are, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, remarkably ignorant if we don't tell them. Yeah, yeah. 
No, I agree. And, you know, there is the, because I'm on, I sit on the scrutiny or the, what's supposed to be the, the, the scrutiny for the city region uh, for that. And it's, it, it's, it's um, interesting <laughs> to use a polite word um, and quite often frustrating. Um, so, yeah, no, I do, I do share your concerns on that. Um, Andy, did you want to come in? Or come back yeah, in? Thanks, Chair. Uh, I, I've been listening to all these uh, different uh, committees and uh, the, the different people who have to discuss this, the number of consultations. Uh, has anybody got actually uh, a, a sort of an idea of when the first of these active travel routes will actually be sorted out and, uh, you know, a date, roughly? That's probably a million dollar I, question. Emma or Kyle, have you I, any? I, I, I can jump in on that one because obviously yep. this year we've been, been given quite um, a substantial amount of active travel money and we are constructing a scheme in, in St. Appen at the moment. So that's on site. Um, we've got um, pretty good funding now from Welsh Government and then we get a core active travel allocation each year and it has to go through a, like a stage gate process. Welsh Government steer us on what they want for us to take those schemes forward. Um, we, we've got one, probably about six or seven schemes at the moment that, that we're looking at with feasibility options and design work throughout the Vale. Um, I would imagine um, that all being well, we would be looking for construction um, probably for in 2023 for, for some of those routes. But again, obviously, it's dependent on funding, depending on whether we get the funding. But at least we're getting funding to get them to that point where we can construct now, which which we weren't getting before. So we've got a good substantial pot to play with and get to that stage. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Yeah. That's it. Okay. So you reckon uh, 2023, we'll be seeing a, a large movement? Yeah, funnily enough, we had this discussion the other day because this, this core allocation became available to, to all authorities at the same time. And you, you, you just hope that we don't all come to construction at the same time and we're all vying for, for, for money to build things and there's, there's not enough money available. So um, hopefully we're ahead of the game on some of the routes and we'll get there before the other authorities do. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. OK, thanks, Kyle. I mean, that was really encouraging. I mean, you must be incredibly busy around all this at the moment and, and trying to keep those spinning plates in the air. Um, with the different schemes and different consultations. So, you know, <laughs> thanks for all your work around that. Um, right, I've got no other speakers. Now, th this came down from Cabinet, um, and they're asking us to look at this report for consideration and for any comments then for us to feed back to Cabinet. Um, so I, th I think really, uh, Gareth, as, as, uh, as our officer, is really just about collating what we've put together, including things um, around this active travel and the further consultations and about making sure that that does come in some form eventually when things are sorted out back down to us for consideration. So I think that is really important. Um, and then uh, about our concerns about um, the numbers of people and organisations who, who did respond and just to explore, even though this is a common theme, just to explore any other methods uh, that we can as, you know, widen that consultation, we're trying to contact people, albeit I think Peter made a really valid point about, um, you know, we are the local members and trying to encourage our residents as well to respond to these. Not always easy, but trying our best to do that. Um, and I think, yeah, Gwyn mentioned around the, um, the route there for Bodleton, Bodleton to St. Athen and potentially around that via the old road, maybe could put that forward as well. And also highlighting then around the Dennis Powers one, the, the route then to Dennis Powers to Barry. Um, but obviously that fits in then with everything else that we've said. Um, I think that's everything. You're very happy around that. Yeah, okay. That's lovely. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Um, really interesting report and, and you know some excellent responses there. And Emma, thank you very much as well for your input. And for Peter, thank you for your input. Very valuable, thank you. Okay, going to move on to the uh, next item then, um, which is item number six, which is the Re Revenue and Capital Monitoring Report for 1st of April to the 30th of November 2021. Um, so, Matthew, this is over to you. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, all. Um, so, yeah, this is the Revenue and Capital Monitor Report, which we regularly get uh, for the first eight months of the financial year. So, the recommendation is that scrutiny consider the position uh, with regard to the 21 22 revenue and capital budgets. So, with regard to the revenue budget, uh, as usual, is a, a table in paragraph 2.1 right at the start of the report which shows the out uh, projected outturn against our current revenue budgets. Um, as in previous reports, the uh, Neighbourhood Services and Transport Service is showing a projected overspend of, of 1.5 million currently. Um, that hasn't changed for, um, for quite a few months now. Um, and we're due to fund that from um, our financial reserves um, so 1.5 million funded from the, the Neighbourhood Services and Transport Reserve this year. Uh, the main reasons for it are uh, due to the additional resources within waste collection, um, mainly within the curbside uh, collection service and um, obviously changing over to a, a source separated service and the additional resources that takes. However, that has um, reduced our um, our costs for treating uh, co-mingled recycling um, and we now receive an income for the majority or I think all of our um, source separated material. Um, all the other services um, currently men mentioned the report currently estimated to outturn on budget. Uh, the report then goes on to um, discuss the savings targets for, for this financial year and they're shown at Appendix 1 to the report. Uh, and they total 162,000 um, for this financial year. And currently we're estimating we'll save around 89,000. However, we are we, work is still ongoing to identify um, further savings um, to ensure that we, we maintain our uh, stay within budget. Uh, capital, um, then the report goes on to discuss the capital budget and appendix two. Uh, details uh, progress against the capital uh, program for this financial year. Um, there's a few projects just to mention um, where we've had additional funding or we've we've had to move funding. Uh, so paragraph 2.10 is um, the Dennis Powers flood resilience project, and we've had uh, 140,000 of Welsh government grant uh, to enable a business justification case. Um, to consider a, a scheme uh, to protect up to 244 houses uh, within uh, Dinis Powys. Uh, we've also um, increased the uh, re highways resurfacing budget by 340,000, and that is to be funded uh, via our policy budget. And that was due to um, emerging uh, resurfacing uh, requirements throughout the financial year. So we, we've had to uh, increase that budget. Um, the next few paragraphs then, so from 2.12 to 2.16, uh, all those paragraphs are concerned with carrying money forward to the, the next financial year, where there's been delay or, or slippage within schemes. Uh, so they are for the waste transfer station, uh, 3.6 million we're looking to carry forward next year. Um, also, um, uh, sourcing equipment and baler um, project, which is which is going into the waste transfer station. Uh, we're looking to carry forward 370,000 of that funded next year. Also, the new HWRC <coughs> uh, capital budget. Uh, there's been delays with that. Um, currently looking at um, purchasing lands. However, 1.6 million of that budget is to be carried forward next year. Uh, roof sustainable transport. Um, the current projection is that project would will be over budget. So um, sources of funding are being looked at, and 409,000 of that budget is to be carried forward to next year. Similar with Eastern Shelter. So we've got a 73,000, we've got a budget, yeah, of around 70 or 1,000 uh, to resurface the roof. But again, it's, it's apparent that that money is not enough. So obviously, um, 
uh, further further funding will be required, and a, a capital bid has been submitted for that uh, project. Um, but obviously, the money the money that's sitting there currently will be carried forward to next year. Um, paragraph two point one seven. We've just had a, a small amount of money, three thousand pound grant uh, for road safety audits um, along Cardiff Road um, and Dennis Powers and Floodgate roundabouts. Uh, two point one eight. Uh, we've we've moved one hundred thirty three thousand uh, pounds worth of funding allocated to the tackling poverty halt road grant. And that is to be used for the Barry Wayfinding project. And the last one to mention, uh, paragraph 2.19, uh, we're carrying forward uh, one million pounds um, of the five mile lane budget. Again, um, due to the de delays in um, finalising the uh, the design of the scheme, um, the, a lot a lot of that money needs to be carried forward to to next financial year. Um, so that's, that's a brief overview. So if there's any questions, I'll I'll take them now. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks, Matt. Um, Andy, you have a question for Matt? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, Matt, that, thanks thanks for that. It's very interesting. Okay. The um, 140,000 pound capital grant for um, uh, Dennis Paris. Uh, having a look at that. Uh, that that's been allocated to doing surveys of individual houses, has it? Um, is, that, is that where that money's coming from? Yeah, Mike, Mike's on the call. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know any further, Mark? I assume it's a business justification case. So yeah, it's looking into the the feasibility is, of the thought. Uh, yeah, is I it, can. Is it, Sorry, go on. Is it the survey, uh, Mike, which the, pe the the householders are being offered? Because you know. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, just to clarify, it, it is a survey. Uh, it's money to undertake a survey of properties that are expressing an interest uh, and then to put a business case together uh, to submit to Welsh Government for funding of implementing the measures on, on the properties that are of interest. At the moment, we've uh, we've sent out letters to all or to the majority of properties um, and we think we've had interest from about 80. Um, but obviously it's still early days, so hoping more people will will contact us. But yeah, um, it's well underway at the moment. Uh, the surveys are underway as well. Um, I think they they at the last time I spoke to the flood action group in Dinis uh, a week or so ago, they'd done about 30 surveys. So everything's uh, ticking over nicely, and we just got to uh, get the information together to submit a, a, a further bid to Welsh government uh, towards the end of financial year or or early next financial year. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. That that was entirely uh, my understanding of the situation. I just thought I'd better check though. Uh, but what what the uh, councillors in Dennis Paris are very concerned about is that only eighty people have actually uh, applied to have have this survey done, uh, and we know that I th I think it was something like one hundred and twenty houses actually flooded. So we're we're a little bit concerned that there are quite a lot of people here. Who aren't getting the message, or um, I mean, it'd be really good if we could get 100% uh, uptake on this in Dennis Paris. Yeah, just to, just to clarify, I think you mentioned um, it's it's over 240 that we're targeting and sending um, letters out to. Uh, those properties include the ones that have been affected by flooding in Dennis Paris um, in December last year. Uh, December 2020, but we've also looked at those properties um, that are potentially affected by future flooding. The one in a one in 100 year flooding uh, um, shown on the uh, NRW flood maps as well. So uh, we're trying to encapsulate more properties um, that are at risk than actually were uh, impacted in December 20. Um, you're, you're quite right that, um, you know, well, as it stood probably a week ago, it was 80. It might be more than that now. Uh, but yes, we, you know, we we would we would like a, a, a better uptake. Um, uh, but unfortunately, the, you know, we we cannot compel people um, to uh, you know to take on board or to or to take up these measures. Um, it's strictly th their um, their their decision, and you know, certain people may have various reasons, you know, why they don't want to take up uh, the offer. I.e., some people. You know, don't want to declare that their property is at risk, 
and, and for that reason, they may what may not want to put their heads above the parapet and actually, um, you know, uh, uh, um, request uh, re request the measures. So various reasons why perhaps people are not um, uh, taking up the offer. But you know, obviously, yeah, we're keen that, that everyone at risk is um, you know is included. We've obviously sent letters out to 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 the to those people, and we're hoping for a response. Yeah, we might we might send out. Further, further letters um, in the future if, if the response is still still poor, just to try and get that that uptake uh, a bit better. Oh, thanks. Can I just ask one more thing? Uh, you, you, if we've had 80 responses, is that from the 244 homes or is it from the 120 odd homes that actually flooded? I, Do we know? I, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have that information. All I know is from the two, uh, some, I think it was 240, maybe even 250 that we sent out. I know we've had a, well, a, a week or so, up to a week or so ago, we had about 80 responses. Um, I don't know the percentage of that from the ones that have been flooded or from the ones that just are at risk for the future. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. OK, thanks, Andy. Um, Councillor Stephen William. Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Bronwyn. Um, well, uh, regarding the Eastern Shelter, really, um, just three questions, three short ones, really. Um, uh, I mean, I noticed that um, it's a capital bid that's been submitted and you say that internal discussions are being carried out. So, um, I mean, I, it just makes me a little bit uncertain as to um, what will happen regarding the work. So, uh, so my, my, my three questions are, um, when will the works be completed? Um, will this impact upon tourism footfall? And are there any safety implications with this uh, with this delay? Okay, thanks, Stefan. It's probably one for you, I'm assuming, Emma. Uh, yeah, Mike's on the call again. Um, Mike can probably update right. us with the latest uh, position. If I just update on the capital bid, so uh, at this at this time, I I don't know what the position is with the capital bid. Um, the costs of the repairs have increased, um, so I would I don't think Michael Mike or I today will be able to answer your when will it be done and what will the impact be on tourism. But Mike can definitely uh, answer your question in terms of, of safety and the likely nature of the repairs that are required. Uh, yeah, so um, we've identified that um, you know there was some uh, concern over concrete uh, um, cracking and potential for spoiling of concrete off the eastern shelter. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, uh, but a couple of years ago we had a comprehensive um, uh, um, a co uh, um, specialist concrete company come in to, to undertake works on the western shelter where the shops and businesses are. Uh, and we anticipate a similar work is required to the Eastern Shelter now. Um, we have uh, been uh, up uh, looking at the uh, defects, uh, the concrete defects at the Eastern Shelter. We've done some uh, tapping exercises where we've been knocking the, uh, uh, the concrete to try and understand where there may be loose areas. And those areas where we have identified uh, particular problems, then we've we've pulled off the loose concrete. And if you walk under the eastern shelter at the moment, you will notice there's a a lot of areas where uh, where the concrete has been um, uh, removed, and you can yeah. probably see some of the steel um, steel parts of the structure. So we feel, um, you know, whereas uh, there's a risk to the structure going forward in the future, and the work needs to be carried out. Uh, we have done some um, in, in investigations, some inspections uh, to try and uh, you know, remove what what is the most uh, risky areas of, of concrete uh, as it stands at the moment. Um, we feel that there is a reasonable amount of safety at the present moment in time, but obviously we need to identify a way forward um, and get a contractor on board to undertake a complete um, uh, investigation of the structure and put together a, a contract in order to undertake the specialist concrete repairs required as, as soon as possible. Um, so, you know, we would hope that that can be moved forward in the next six to 12 months um, so that we can, uh, you know, we can, we can, we, we can ensure that structure is uh, safe for the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Uh, Councillor Peter King? Want to come in again? Yeah, I'm sorry to be a blessed nuisance, Chair, and thank you, Committee, for indulging me. 
Um, over the flooded homes, I think I think we do need to be mindful that um, there is an issue about confidentiality. Um, and if somebody wishes not to re reveal or draw attention to the flooding, um, that is their prerogative. I mean, I think there's I think the, 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 the rules about selling homes and telling your insurer are a separate issue that is not necessarily one for you and me as counsellors. But I, I, I would be inclined to ask um, perhaps Mike um, whether it is possible for uh, the council to pr produce a um, sort of some sort of leaflet letter drop and invite the councillors to wander around and just post it through the um, the, the, the vulnerable, all the vulnerable dwellings that we that we or, or the areas that we know that, don't, that were vulnerable because that doesn't single anybody out. Um, We'd be very and, happy to do that. If well, somebody, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just. Uh, that's why I'm wondering. But I mean, there is this issue about confidentiality, which is why if you do everybody, then it's that it's a sort of a, uh, it, it doesn't raise any particular stigma. And I, I don't know whether it's, it's something that may be worth considering because I we, like we, you we, would rather. We've it actually done it, Peter. We hoovered up we, as many as possible. Yeah, it's already been done. We've okay. done that. Fair we enough. Did thank last you. Saturday. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Andy, for that. Um, right, I've got no other, nobody else wishing to speak. So, are we happy to um, note the position that we're in at the present moment um, in relation to the budget uh, or for the end of year? Yeah. Okay, that's lovely. Okay, thanks very much, Matthew. Um, that's you done as well for this evening. So, thank you for your interest. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, okay you'll move on to item number seven which is the quarter three recommendation tracking and then also an update on the forward work programme. Um, and obviously this is our our usual report. Um, as it sort of advises people of progress in relation to the scrutiny committee's historical recommendation and also then our proposed annual work forward programme schedule for 21-22. Um, it's, it's our usual report, as I said. So I, have, I just want to draw your attention then to some of the key points. Um, in Appendix A, on page two, under the uncompleted recommendations for the December meeting, there were the initial revenue budget proposals. Um, the committee had a number of comments, and these were considered by the Corporate Performance and Resources Scrutiny Committee at its meeting held on the 22nd of December. Um, and then Corporate Resources supported the comments made by our committee and agreed for these to be considered by Cabinet. So we'll keep this open as ongoing until Cabinet has then has, has made the decisions um, around that. Um, and again, then for the capital budget, uh, the Corporate Performance and Resources Scrutiny Committee, they also supported our recommendation, um, which will be considered by Cabinet. Um, and again, we'll keep, keep that one open and keep people updated when we receive that from Cabinet as well. Um, under Appendix B, which is uncompleted recommendation from the September 2021 meeting, um, that was actually related to the active travel network and they were noted by Cabinet, so that recommendation has been set as completed uh, now. Under Appendix E, the uncompleted recommendation from 2018-19 um, and the biomass plant review report, this was considered by committee in October and we did have a you know a long and detailed discussion and debate around that. And then that actually led us recommending that the matter be referred to full council, which did actually take place then on the 6th of December. Um, and then council resolved to endorse the contents and findings of the re review report. So that recommendation is therefore completed. Um, so is everybody happy with the status of those that I've just uh, read out there? Yeah, OK. Right, so the forward work programme, which is under Appendix F. Um, now, the key point for the forward work programme is one report has slipped, which is the Section 19 flood report. Um, it, it's been delayed due to staff resources, which are out of our control, um, but, we, but we've seeked or we sought a reassurance that the presentation will come to our committee at the next meeting in February. Um, and we've also 
invited representatives of NRW to that meeting. So there will be an update report there. And fingers crossed NRW uh, will attend as well. Right, so can I ask now if there are any reports that members wish to prioritise or any suggestions for us to look at? Anybody's got anything? No? That's lovely. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, okay, I've got no other items which are urgent under part one or under part two. Um, so it's just a reminder then that the next meeting is scheduled for the 15th of February. Okay, so I'd just like to thank everybody for their input tonight. Um, there were some good discussions there. And thank all the officers and cabinet members for attending along with us as well. Um, so I'd just like to wish everybody a safe evening and good night. Okay, bye everybody. Right. Thank night. you very much. I thought.